All right, so um, I'm really excited to have you all here for our first uh, kickoff event for um, the winter 2024 semester with our preschool lecture series. And I'm going to give an brief introduction of Dr. Castle in a moment. But I, before I do that, I just want to also um, highlight some of our upcoming events, which we hope you'll all return for and bring your friends. We'll get some more chairs. Um, on our next Crease Noon lecture is on Friday, February 2nd. It's actually, you can stay in the comfort of your home if you want to. It's going to be um, over Zoom because um, Olga Kostetska, who's the public health lead at the Project USA, USA Public Health System Recovery and Resilience Activity, which for Swiss uh, TPH, is going to be joining us live from Ukraine. Like, it turns out if you're on the ground doing public health work, it's not so convenient to come to Ann Arbor for your Korean student lecture. So we're excited to have her um, live with us from Kiev on uh, public health in Ukraine challenges and opportunities during the war and priorities for post-war recovery. And also um, this Friday, Chris is happy to co-sponsor this event series called Queer Focus, Gender and Sexualities in Eastern Europe and Eurasia, panel three, it's mini series, um, several panels throughout the course of the semester, but the next one will be on arts and culture on Friday, February 2nd. Um, you can also find the links to these events on our website and or join our mail list. I also want to let you all know where Chris is happy to co-sponsor a series of events that are focused on Ukraine in the month of February, including two film screenings on the 5th and the 12th, and the WCE Distinguished Lecture, The Fight of Our Lives by Yulia Zendel, who's a, a Ukrainian journalist and author, um, with former President uh, Zelensky's press secretary, and is currently here at the University of Michigan as a WCE Distinguished Fellow and Knight Wallace Fellow. So we hope that you will join us for these events and also um, the ones that we have yet to come in, in the coming months of our semester. All right, but uh, now here today, we have Dr. Carrie Castle, who's an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame, where she specializes in the study of contemporary Russian and Chinese politics, authoritarianism, and religion and politics. She's the author of several books, Religion and Authoritarianism, Cooperation, Conflict, and the Consequences, co-editor of Citizens of the State and Authoritarian Regimes, Comparing China and Russia, and a fellow in the public intellectual program for the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Dr. Kessel is currently working on a book, Learning to be Loyal, Political Education in Authoritarian Regimes, which I think we're going to hear a lot more about, get a sneak peek of that research. Um, and prior to joining the University of Notre Dame, Dr. Kessel taught at the University of Oregon and received her PhD in government from Cornell University. So as noted by this great turnout, Russia and China relations are on a lot of our minds and we're happy to have, um, you know, that you were able to come from uh, Notre Dame to share your knowledge with us. So thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and thank you for the warm introduction. And what a great turnout. Uh, what I'm presenting today is a work in progress. This is a book that I've been working on, which really explores questions of legitimacy and resilience across authoritarian regimes. And it begins with this idea that all states use their educational system to build support. After all, what better investment in the regime is educating young people, teaching them to be supportive of their leaders, their institutions, their political and economic systems? Now, certainly China and Russia are no exception to this generalization, and both extensively use education to build support among young people. So to illustrate this point and show you how political education works, I want to begin in a bit of an unconventional way with a children's book from Russia. And perhaps you can tell from the cover who the hero of our story is. <laughs> now, this is a book about elections in Russia. And I think it's a really good example of political or often patriotic education. So the book begins in the following way. Once upon a time, the people of this great land decided to hold an election, but they couldn't decide whom to choose. So the ladies of the land suggested, perhaps we should choose the most handsome candidate. But the people reject this idea. They don't want a candidate who is gazing at himself in the mirror all day and not working for the country. 
<laughs> Another lady suggests perhaps we should choose the tallest candidate. People can see him from far away and respect him. But of course, the people reject this idea. He might make the other governors and deputies feel insecure because he's much taller. But of course, they don't want a short president either. Another woman suggests perhaps we should choose the strongest president. He will be so strong and people will respect him right away. But again, the people reject this idea in the story. If he gets into a fight with another president, he beats up that president, this will lead to war, and these are peace-loving people. Perhaps one lady suggests we should choose the smartest president. But the people reject this idea. They don't want, and I quote, an egg-headed professor, <laughs> someone who will make the rest of them feel foolish. And so the people are continuing to debate whom to choose. And in this moment, a teacher steps forward and asks the crowd, whom among you is the most modest? And you can see lots of men jumping up and down, waving their hands, shouting, me, 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 I am the most modest, please choose me. And the people can't decide. And then in our story, an old man with a long gray beard, he steps forward and says, perhaps we should choose the president like the legend. So in the old days, the sparrow would land on the shoulder of the czar, this auspicious symbol. So the next day, everybody, all of the people arrive in Red Square. And what you can see on the slide, all of the candidates on the stage, we see the tallest, <laughs> we see the strongest with his barbell, the one with glasses and the briefcase who kind of looks like Brezhnev, that's the egg-headed academic. <laughs> you see the, the old man with the beard. And if you look very closely, some of the candidates have shoved bread in their pockets and sprinkled bird seed, the story tells us, on their shoulders, hoping to attract the sparrow. And just as the election is getting underway, of course, on the right of our screen, all dressed in white, as any good hero should be, of course, striding into Red Square with the sparrow on his shoulder is the hero of our story. And the crowd shouts, look, look, the sparrow has chosen the most modest candidate, and we shall choose him too. And so this is the story of how the president becomes the president. But this is not the end of the story. Oh, no. <laughs> The president goes on to save Russia from bombs, from wars, and even dragons. After all, it is a fairy tale. But he doesn't just save Russia, he saves the world. So what you can see from this slide, the, the hero of our story, our president, puts on his judo uniform. For those of you that don't know Vladimir Putin, um, I say he's very he's a big fan of judo and he's quite skilled at it. So here he is tackling a dragon, which is eating the American president, who kind of I think looks like Bill Clinton. Well, uh, the German and the uh, the British presidents stand on cheering. So this is the end of our story. Happily ever after, the most modest candidate is chosen. He saves Russia. He saves the world. So this is an unconventional fairy tale to be sure, but I think there are some important lessons for Russian young people. Number one, a clear message about Vladimir Putin, his qualities, his, his skill set. He's honest, he's modest, he's fearless. It shows continuity with the past, Tsarist Russia to Putin's Russia, this auspicious symbol of the sparrow selecting the Tsar. There's also a message about political opposition, this sort of motley crew of characters, the liars, the cheats, the eggheads, <laughs> and of course, a gendered message. You notice there were no women among the candidates, so perhaps this would not be the fairy tale I would read to my own daughters. But the point of this story is that it's not terribly exceptional. Indeed, there's a long history of regimes around the world attempting to shape the one worldview of young people through education, and specifically political education. So this book is really motivated by three sets of questions. How do autocratic regimes like Russia and China, how do they attempt to promote loyalty among their younger generations, especially globalized generations? How do they educate students and future elite to be supportive of those in power? What are these strategies of legitimation? How do they, how do they shift and sharpen over time? And what does this mean for broader questions about durability and resilience of these regimes? And so what I'm going to present today is a small slice of this work in project, a little bit of a background on political education. So we're all on the same page. Some of the theoretical arguments about what political education is doing for these regimes. And then I want to take you into the classrooms, inside Chinese and Russian classrooms, to show you the political knowledge that's being transmitted to young people and how these pillars of legitimacy are being constructed. Okay, so let's first start with political education. What is it? How do you know it when you see it? 
Political education is nothing new. So philosophers as ancient as Plato and Aristotle, revolutionaries like Lenin and Mao, they all talked about the importance of education in cementing support for those who rule. For the simple idea, what we learn early on in life is assumed to stay with us. It is difficult to displace. And so education becomes this key arena for building support for the regime. Now in democracies, support for the political system is fostered in civic education courses. So probably many of you took civic education in high school or middle school. Civics teaches us about the nuts and bolts of the political system, joining political parties, why to vote, checks and balances. Social sciences talk about civics as a guardian of democracy, normatively good, contributing to the health of a democratic regime. In autocracies, civics are also integral components of the educational system, but we tend to call them political or patriotic education. And often it's dismissed as propaganda, indoctrination, even brainwashing, normatively quite negative. But what I argue is that there are some striking similarities between political education and civics within democracies. After all, both develop the building blocks of political knowledge, both set the skill sets for responsible citizenship, and they both are tools of socialization, essentially to create diffuse support around the regime. Indeed, political education or patriotic education is an extensive tool across the authoritarian world. Here are some examples. In Belarus, political education courses are compulsory. And they focus on morality, patriotism. They draw heavily on President Lukashenko's speeches and ideas of traditional culture. In Vietnam, undergraduates, 12% of their coursework is devoted to political education courses. Classes on Marxism, Leninism, Ho Chi Minh thought, scientific socialism, the history of the Vietnamese Communist Party. Graduate students have to take an additional 60 hours of political education courses before they can advance to candidacy. In Singapore, the emphasis is on Asian values. So here is responsibility to one's family, to one's parents, to one's community about this idea of creating a cohesive workforce. Saudi Arabia, religion is infused in political education, emphasis on obedience to the authority and special respect given to the first monarch of the kingdom. Of course, Russia has a long and rich tradition of political or often called patriotic education in the Russian context dating back to the communist era. Lenin, after all, talked about it. schools as these key transmission belts for building communism. And within schools, we saw social groups, young pioneers, communist youth league or Komsomol, playing really formative roles in the upbringing of young Soviets. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, political education was phased out of many classrooms across Russia. But by the late 1990s, as we see difficulties in Russia's democratic transition and particularly economic crisis, there were growing calls among teachers and other groups in society to reintegrate patriotic education within to Russian, Russian schools. And indeed, after Vladimir Putin comes to power and consolidates power, we see billions of rubles being um, spent towards this initiative. So patriotic education programming is beginning now in kindergartens and going into university. However, I should add, it is not at the same level, not at the same degree of exposure as the Soviet, uh, Soviet times. And finally, China in many cases is the gold standard of political and patriotic education. It's been in place since the Communist Party came to power in the 50s and has been uninterrupted. So to give you a sense, in primary school, Chinese students spend at least one hour each week in political education courses. They learn about the nuts and bolts of the institutions, of the regime, the founding of the party, the symbols of the state, the flag, the national anthem, etc. And this regiment continues all through their educational training in middle school, in high school, even to university education. Now, you may be wondering, why are so many autocracies investing and investing so heavily in political or patriotic education? And the argument that I suggest in the book is that this is really about day-to-day -day regime maintenance. This is everyday strategies of control. And this argument is anchored in two distinctive literatures in social science. The political socialization literature, which comes largely out of American politics, talks about political socialization as the transmission of political knowledge and ideas to orient one's behavior. Often this takes place in schools, but of course you're also socialized by your peer group and by your family structures as well. But within schools, how does this work? So political education courses teach knowledge of the regime, such as support 
the leaders, support the party, support the institutions, love Lenin, respect authority. They also set the norms and expectations of good behavior, what it means to be a good and engaged citizen. The goal here is to create diffuse support or associational support around shared political orientations, both across generations and vertically between generations as well. Hopefully so that these generations share the same worldview, political worldview as those in power. Now, the second set of literature that I'm anchoring this argument in comes from comparative politics, and I would call this the authoritarian toolkit literature. And I argue that political education is a tool. And it should be seen along other instruments within this toolkit. Now, often in the toolkit, we think of repression and co-optation as the two dominant tools, sort of carrots and sticks. I would put political education also within the toolkit, but it's different. It's a tool of persuasion, not necessarily co-optation and certainly not one of repression. And the goal here is about creating stakeholders in the political system <laughs> across generations to preempt the volume and the type of demands that are stemming from society. Now, let me turn briefly to the materials. This project started um, pre-COVID and it has evolved since then for, for many reasons, um, But I'm, and I'm happy to talk about the field work that I conducted pre-COVID, but it has evolved into a largely textual project. So in the Russian and the Soviet case, I've collected textbooks. These are textbooks used in social studies, civics, military patriotic education from the Soviet period um, to the present. And, and um, I've also included teacher's manuals or teacher's guides. These are written by teachers for teachers and provide instruction on how to integrate patriotic content into the classroom. Uh, in China, I've also looked at textbooks, but for this project, I focus largely on something called the National College Entrance Exam. In China, this is colloquial, co colloquially called the Gaokao or the high exam. It is the gatekeeper of higher education. If you want to attend university, you have to take this very important high stakes examination. So we can think of it as the equivalent of the ACT or the SAT. But trust me, it is a far more formidable exam. Chinese young people spend much of their young life preparing for this exam. The national curriculum is all geared towards this really high stakes test. And those who get the highest scores get access to the best universities. Now, the Gaokao covers a variety of subjects, mathematics, Chinese, history, foreign language, sciences, geography, and of course, politics. So I've collected the politics exams from the 50s to the exam that was offered last summer to think about these different strategies of legitimation and how they change. Methodologically, I use both qualitative and quantitative textual analysis, and I'm happy to, to talk more about those if you have questions, but to help us understand really how these regimes are attempting to socialize young people to be supportive. Finally, let me just say a few words about what I think is the advantage of these textual materials. Um, number one is that they provide a resource for thinking about legitimacy and especially how autocratic regimes attempt to cultivate excuse me, legitimacy among their youth. Um, they show the political priorities of those in power and what they wanna to transmit to young people. The textbooks and exams are also written and vetted by regime representatives. They go through a, an extensive process of re review. So we see the language of the regime, so short of the benchmark of political and ideological correctness. It also gives us leverage over time, thinking about how strategies of legitimation change. And finally, perhaps more practically, these are open source resources. In a time where fieldwork was impossible in China because of the pandemic or because of now the war in Russia, Many of these can be available, found um, online or, or within libraries. Okay, so let's jump to some of the empirics. And the argument that I'm going to present to you today is from a chapter about how legitimacy is being constructed. And it's sort of this, this dual narrative, one about propping up and undermining. Um, first, let's start with the Chinese case. So within the Chinese materials, we see a propping up of the CCP, propping up of the Chinese Communist Party. The party is depicted in really positive ways. Benevolent, selfless, confident, capable, all wonderful things, advancing China. Now this pro-party narrative is not surprising at all. After all, this is the goal of political education to encourage young people to socialize them to accept and support communist party rule. However, there's a second narrative within the materials, which is more subtle. And this I argue is about orienting students away from the competition from potential competitors, 
whether that's the West. So here, this narrative points to the flaws and the failures of Western political systems, their leaders, downsides of elections, downsides of capitalism, or focuses on Western aggression directed at China. And I argue that these two narratives, both propping up and undermining, work in tandem with one another. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the pro-party narrative. It is pretty straightforward, and I'm sure you can imagine. But sort of the, the mantra from the 1950s, without the party, there would be no new China. This was present in the 50s. This is present in political education materials today. <clears throat> but let me just show you a few questions from the examination to give you a flavor, a sense of, of how the party is portrayed. So students need to essentially know that the Communist Party is the key. Here's a question uh, from 2000, where G Secretary, uh, General Secretary Jiang Zemin says, to do a good job in China, the key point lies in our party, so long as our party always represents a force for advanced social development. And it goes on to a talk about the invincibility of the party and how the party is leading people forward. And here, of course, the correct answer is both A and C, that the party is advanced and that the party is the core leadership of socialism. One more example of pro-party. This is my favorite question um, of all time on the Galco exam, so I'm going to share it with you because it's a, it's pretty over the top. Uh, it talks about, with their selfless dedication, the Chinese communists have been committed, loyal, and dedicated to the Chinese nation's revival. It goes on to talk about the brilliant achievements of the party. And the reason we have such brilliant achievements is that the party is the vanguard of the people and is, again, advancing China. So again, the message here, it gives you a sense of how the party is portrayed. Brilliant, selfless, dedicated, proactive. The second more subtle narrative, the undermining narratives, <clears throat> focuses on aspects such as foreign aggression, Western imperialism, or the hypocrisy of Western economic systems and political systems. And I argue that this undermining narrative, the goal here again is to diminish demand for the competition undermine the West in general, but specifically the United States tends to be the largest target. So imperialism, let's start with three questions here. One from the 50s, one from the 60s, and one from the 1990s. Now what these three questions have in common is a, a shared thread of American imperialism. In the 1950s, students had to fill in the blank that recently American imperialists bombed the Yalu River plant, a power plant, which caused protests, of course, from all over the globe. A question from the 1960s. Why can the Kennedy administration be only worse and not better than the Eisenhower <laughs> administration? And again, the correct answer is in red. This is taken from the answer keys. Um, it, essentially, it's because imperialism is not going to change. And again, a question from the 1990s talking about the ways that the U.S. has tried Western aggression directed at China, whether that's invading North Korea, occupying Taiwan, essentially attempting to isolate and contain and hold China back. So again, the message here, American imperialists, this is a threat and it looms large. Now, in the 1990s, the language of imperialism disappears in political education materials within China. But this same sentiment of the U.S. trying to hold China back appears in other ways, in more subtle ways. So here's a question from 2003, or excuse me, 2013. And this question is asking about the acquisitions of the Four Winds Power Project. This is located in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. And a Chinese company attempted to buy th this power plant. And this was prohibited by an executive order by the Obama administration. Obama stepped in and said, this is a matter of national security. This Chinese company is unable to purchase it. And so the question stresses here that Chinese entrepreneurs and Chinese companies are facing disadvantages. It's an uneven playing field in the American, um, in the American market. So the language of imperialism shifts to American protectionism, sort of is updated. Another undermining narrative, capitalism. Students, Chinese students need to understand the downsides, the many downsides of capitalism, linking it to imperialism, colonialism, the slave trade, economic crises, unemployment, and inequality. So these questions on the slide, <clears throat> two from the 80s and one from the 70s, often put capitalism in contrast with socialism. Here, the expected answers, of course, ask students to explain the superiority of socialism. Refute the following fallacy. Our country's socialism is not better than capitalism. Which one is good, a socialist system or a capitalist system? 
Of course, a socialist system is good. <clears throat> so what you can see, these are far from neutral questions, but they're priming students to answer in a certain way. Now, interestingly, of course, in, in, during opening reform, China embraces capitalism. In 2001, entrepreneurs are welcomed into the ranks of the Communist Party. So you may be wondering how this is squared within political education materials. Well, what we see is that capitalism, Western capitalism, is often described as monopoly capitalism. And it's compared with socialism with Chinese characteristics, with this Chinese version of capitalism. So we're just doing wonderful things. So this is an essay question. And then let me just provide a little bit of background. It gives four passages that the students need to read, sort of reading comprehension. And then the students need to analyze the dual nature of early capitalism as opposed to uh, socialist modernization. Two of the passages are from Marx. One is from Williams, which essentially link capitalism to slavery, to genocide, to imperialism and colonialism. And this is juxtaposed with a speech from Hu Jintao, which is talking about Chinese socialist modernization and modern development, which is advancing China forward. So again, the takeaway for students, Western capitalism linked to slavery, colonialist imperialism, is put in stark contrast with the Chinese model, Chinese capitalism, or what is called socialism with Chinese characteristics. So again, propping up the Chinese model and undermining the alternatives. Finally, the questions go to some length <clears throat> to foster skepticism about Western political institutions, whether that's liberal democracy or elections or the downsides of elections within the United States or our two-party system. I'm gonna show you two questions that discuss elections and the downsides of elections in the United States. This first question provides, I would say, a very cynical interpretation about how uh, presidential elections operate. Essentially, the answer here is C, that money is the mother's milk of politics. Whoever raises the most money has the better odds to win. The second question talks about the role of the media in influencing elections. Now, this question is about the 1988 presidential election. So think back to this. This is Bush Sr. He was vice president at the point. He, at that time, he is the Republican, uh, Republican nominee. And during this campaign, there was a rumor circulating around Washington that he was having an extramarital affair. This was picked up by a reporter at the Washington Post, and the Post editorial board decided not to publish it. Nevertheless, shortly thereafter, the Democratic nominee or the presumed Democratic nominee, Gary Hart, if this rings any bells, a photo appeared of him having an affair, which essentially sunk his chances of becoming the Democratic nominee. So what this question is really shining the spotlight, both of them shining the spotlights on the downside of elections, whether elections can be bought or whether media outlets can influence the outcome of elections. I think they're also interesting because they show a level of sophistication that a 17 year old in China needs to know about presidential politics and elections within the United States. Finally, like many of the other questions, we see socialist democracy, which is Chinese democracy, put in contrast with capitalist democracy, which we might have in the US. Of course, socialist democracy is the good kind of democracy and capitalist democracy is not. And the idea here is the big difference between them as the question asks is that socialist democracy is superior because the majority of the people enjoy it and it is extensive, it is authentic. So what you see from these Chinese examples is not only the affirmation of the Chinese system and the Chinese leadership, but also a direct undermining of the competition, the political and economic alternatives. Now, these themes continue within the Soviet and the Russian textbooks. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus my comments mostly on the post-Soviet textbooks um, and particularly how they discuss democracy, because I think this is quite interesting. However, I should add that the Soviet textbooks, the rhetoric is very similar to the Chinese textbooks around, for example, the idea of democracy. Soviet power is described as the only true democracy for the working people. The Soviet system is the most democratic in the world, the textbooks write about, and real democracy is only possible under conditions of socialism. So these same narratives in the Soviet and Chinese uh, political education materials are, are present. But in the post-Soviet textbooks, what I find is that this dual narrative is also present around democracy. We see that democracy is held up as an ideal, 
But the same textbooks, in fact, even sometimes the same chapters, undermine democracy later on. So to give you a sense of that, what you're seeing on the slide is a sentiment analysis. And I want to draw your attention to the far right, so the post-Soviet era. So anytime the word democracy comes up in a textbook, what this analysis is sort of measuring whether that sentence is largely positive or largely negative. And what we can see in the post-Soviet context is sort of a very mixed message. A lot of negativity when democracy comes up and a lot of positivity. So trying to unpack what might be going on here. Now let's look into the, the textbooks themselves to figure out what this mixed message is. <clears throat> First of all, within the post-Soviet textbooks, I think there are three ways that democracy is discussed overwhelmingly in a positive way. First, Russia is democratic. Two, democracy is an idea, ideal. And three, Russia has these historic democratic anchors. Now let me go through each of these. First of all, all of the post-Soviet textbooks absolutely classify Russia as a democratic regime. So there's no discussion of it as a hybrid regime or a competitive authoritarian regime that political scientists like to use these terms. Russia is a democratic country, a democratic republic. It's chosen a democratic path. Dictatorial governments are a thing of the past. Russia is a democracy, full stop. Democracy is also elevated. It's idealized. Some of the textbooks talk about it as the most important achievement in humanity and playing it a crucial role in global politics around the world. It's a common form of government. It's a popular form of government. Democratic leaders are open. They're open to criticism. They're responsive. They cooperate. They're benevolent. And third, the textbooks go to some efforts to talk about Russia's historic democratic past. So, so bear with me for just a moment. The examples that they tend to point to are the following. Zemsky Sabor. So this was a consultative council for the Tsar created under Ivan the Terrible, not terribly democratic. The Senate of Peter the Great, the State Duma at the beginning of the 20th century, even the Congress of the People's Deputies of the Soviet Union are all held up as examples of Russia's democratic past to show that there's a history of parliamentarianism, parliamentarianism, excuse me, in Russia. I would argue that this is much more of an imagined democratic past. These are far more decorative than really having democratic teeth. But nevertheless, the textbooks go to some effort to point to these sort of Russia has a strong and rich democratic traditions. Now for the downsides. Just as this propping up message is present in the textbook, we also see an undermining message towards democracy in the post-Soviet context. The textbooks point to the flaws of democracy, contradictions, weaknesses inherent in the system. Many of the textbooks talk about democracy is not an ideal regime type. Political parties and social movements, they crowd out citizens and they crowd out the interests and rights of voters. One textbook borrows from Churchill and says that democracy is simply the lesser form of evil than all other forms of government. And they identify specific problems with democracy, weak and undisciplined political parties, corrupt institutions, challenges to elections, campaign financing. Now, let me be clear, it's not about stolen elections, which has been a problem in post-Soviet Russia, but about campaign finance is the main issue that they're targeting. They also talk about lack of transparency and corruption in bureaucracies, that democracy has exacerbated these facts. So the point is, there are democratic ideals that are held up, and then there are democratic realities. And the reality is, is that Russia's democratic transition hasn't delivered. The textbooks are quite upfront, pointing out many of the challenges, declining living standards, poverty, inequality, state capture, oligarchs absence of rule of law, corruption. So the message here is that the Soviet model, the post-Soviet model didn't really bring about, this transition didn't bring about liberal democratic model, but democratic consolidation in many ways is a work in progress. So you may be wondering, how do the textbooks explain who is to blame for this work in progress? First group to blame, of course, are the people themselves. The textbooks explain that Russian people don't have the right democratic mindset. They lack democratic experience. They lack democratic consciousness. So this is a bit of a mixed message from talking about democratic anchors in the past. And this lack of democratic mindset has had serious implications for governing, for things like tax collection. 
you would be surprised how much tax collection comes up in the civic education textbooks. Entire chapters are devoted to tax, uh, to, to, to tax evasion. I looked at my daughter's civic education course, uh, textbooks for high school. No, I couldn't find anything on taxes other than you should pay your taxes, but certainly not a chapter about the problem of tax evasion. Second group to blame. Russian political culture, or sometimes described as Russian mentality, which was formed under totalitarianism or monarchy that has been really incompatible with hosting this transition. Russian political culture is described in the following ways, submissive to authority, distrusting of the government, anarchic, a strong thirst for a centralized power, low respect of law and individual rights, the idea that authority must be feared if it is to be respected. And to strengthen these points, the textbooks draw on public opinion data, unsighted public opinion data, I should add, but say that the majority of Russians refer, prefer order and stability, a strong centralized government to democracy and democratic reforms. So let me be clear, this is not to say that Russian political culture cannot change. The textbooks aren't giving that message, but this is a slow and gradual process. Final group to blame is the Soviet Union, of course, these Soviet legacies that local authorities sort of holdovers from the, from the Soviet experience. They are corrupt and they continue to perpetrate everyday forms of corruption against individuals. Moreover, the Russian bureaucracy, which I would see as part of the state, is described largely in negative ways. Badly organized, corrupt, focusing on personal gains over the interests of the public, one scathing example from a 2020 textbook, which I quote here, says the following. Our bureaucracy is still to a large extent a closed and sometimes simply arrogant caste that understands public service as a kind of business. So the lesson here for Russian young people is that the country will consolidate democratically in the future, but in the meantime, temper your expectations. Democratic rule is a lot more difficult than dictatorial ones. And moreover, there's this implicit message that copying the West, mechanically following the West and Western ideas will not lead to an accelerated democracy or rule of law within the Russian context. So in the meantime, continue to support strong leaders. After all, the country has a long history of strong centralized leadership, which in many cases helps the nation flourish at different points. So let me just wrap up with a few ideas. So again, the purpose of this project in this book is really to think about how authoritarian regimes like Russia, like China, how they use politi political education to promote loyalty and allegiance among their younger generations who are increasingly globalized. And I use political education materials really as a window into this process of legitimation to show us what knowledge the regime is trying to transmit and teach its young people, how they are socializing them to be supportive, and what I've shown you is that across both China and Russia, we see a similar narrative, both propping up and undermining. And these, this dual narrative works in tandem with one another. So in China, a narrative that props up the party, its accomplishments, the leaders, is a sophisticated communist party, advancing China, the bringer of progress and order of stability. At the same time, this undermining narrative orienting students away from the competition, political or ideological, shining the spotlight on Western aggression, imperialism, the exploitative nature of capitalism, the downsides or the unfairness of democratic political institutions. So about bolstering support for the party and undermining alternatives. In Russia, in the post-Soviet materials, I show you that they're both supportive and subversive in their discussions of democracy. Russia's democratic, democracy is an ideal, but at the same time, the process is somewhat out of reach. So temper your expectations towards democracy. And in the meantime, continue to support a strong centralized leader, a president. After all, the country has a long tradition. So the lesson here for Russian students is that autocracy is not ideal, but it may be unavoidable, at least in the meantime, until we address the other problems of the Russian people, their mentality, and these looming Soviet legacies. And a final point, just some implications. I think one implication is this project shows us how regimes attempt to construct legitimacy, sort of a, a deep dive into it. It shows us the day-to-day -day strategies of regime maintenance, about durability. It shows us that regime maintenance is just about as 
just about as much as eroding support for alternatives as it is for building support or propping up the status quo. It also shows us what Russian young people and Chinese young people are taught to think about themselves, their country, their country's position within the world, which I think is important. And moreover, it helps us think broadly about global assaults on democracies. And what I mean by that as part of the narrative within China and also Russia is that Western democracy is incompatible. It's corrupt, it's chaotic, it's non-responsive, but also that democracy is already present in these countries. And in some cases, particularly in the Chinese case, the material suggests that it is flourishing. It is surpassing Western democracy. And I think this is important when we think about broader issues of whether we're in an autocratic wave or issues of democratic erosion, because political education materials, they show us the hollowing out of the concept of democracy and how this is taking place within classrooms in authoritarian regimes like Russia and China. So that I will stop. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Yes. Discuss like what happens when there is like opposition, like within like a classroom setting, and if that's dealt with more strictly or kind of like a gentle guidance towards like the right ideals and concepts. Okay, so a great question. So what happens within the classroom, in these political education classrooms, when perhaps a, a student pushes back on some of the sentiments? Uh, I can speak to the, the Russian case because I did spend so, quite a bit of time in Russian classrooms before this. Um, I think the answer is it depends considerably on the teacher. So Russian teachers have, they are, they are very authoritative in, in the classroom, far more than I think in, in American classrooms. And so in some classrooms I observed when students push back, the teachers push back even further and very much silence the students. But that wasn't the case. That wasn't the teaching style of, of all students. Often the teachers would sit very uncomfortably if the students were talking about um, that they did not support Vladimir Putin, that they didn't think that he was a, a good president. And so they would you know, sit there very uncomfortably. Um, so it really depends on the dynamic of, of the teacher um, and, and in the classroom in particular. Yes. In recent years, it seems like in the American educational systems and also academia in general, that there's a lot of self-criticism of the United States, which is obviously a positive thing because we're looking at history from a different perspective. But when Russia and China, for example, are very critical of the United States as well and patriotic in their education. Is there any idea of like what the long-term ramifications might be when we're being self-critical, which is obviously positive in the West in general is, but then other countries are also being critical, if that makes sense? So are you asking what would be the long-term implications for perhaps how Chinese or Russian or just like students would as be? a global... It's like global I don't know phenomenon? if I'm expressing... No, I think they, no it's, it's a terrific question. I think... Um, how I might respond to that is in the Russian classrooms, I would say there is some self-criticism that is definitely evident within the textbooks and in the, the particularly within the students. They recognize that the textbooks say that they are, it is a democratic country, but they see it at a big gap between that. And so there's some sort of self-criticism and, and reflexivity. I did not observe that within the Chinese classrooms. And so I've, it's not a lot of self-criticism going on within, within the Chinese classrooms. But again, my experience was far more limited in the Chinese classrooms than the Russians. Whether I think that has broader implications. Um, for me, I think self-criticism is, uh, that is essentially a, a core component of learning and that nations need to be self-critical. They need to understand their past. They need to grapple with them and, and, and deal with these legacies in an open, honest way. That's the point of education. And so sort of putting it in a box and pretending it doesn't exist or calling it something else, I think in the long run is quite detri detrimental. Mary. Um, thanks. And I just want to warn you, I have to teach it once. So That's okay. I, I know a few other people have to, sure. to okay. pop out, so right. feel free to, to... I have two, two, one, one, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So my first question is, um, trying to, you said it initially in your intro remarks that you don't see this as like, as part of the authoritarian toolkit as a, a tool of repression or coercion. And I wanted to, I mean, I, I, I actually don't really understand how the Gao might be lit linked to other types of outcomes, but if it is linked to things like access to certain types of universities or to certain types of jobs in the state sector or in civil service, to me, that is a kind of, kind of coercion, coercion that, you know, you know, you have to be compliant on these exams in order to get into the system. 
So I wanted you to, to just talk about, do you know if the gal cow is used in that way, um, particularly the, the patriotic education? And then um, secondly, I was wondering if, it seems to me that in the Chinese Communist Party's, um, the way in which it's talked about democracy over the last um, 40 years under the reform period, that it has moved much farther towards this, like the Chinese um, Chinese history and culture is incompatible with democracy, but that there certainly was a point in the 80s and 90s where it was much more about China's not ready for democracy and whether you, you can see um, changes over time within, within a country. Thank you. Thanks. They're both great questions. Um, I'll, I'll start with the second one, uh, how democracy has been discussed within the, in the Chinese context over time. Um, so I think earlier, often it is classifying what we mean by Chinese democracy, and often that's socialist democracy. And so socialist yeah. democracy, they are ready for it. It is extensive. It is authentic. It's, it's far more representative. Um, and this narrative has been, I would say, a dominant one, and it, it hasn't gone away. I haven't seen in the more recent, in the more recent textbooks, it is that, and in the Gaokao uh, examination questions, it's not that democracy is less important or that they're undermining it or saying that it's incompatible. It's just, it's not tested on the examination. It would be talking more generally about how the, society, uh, the party is delivering governance and stability and order and prosperity and sort of not discussing democracy. And so, if it is discussed, it is socialist democracy, and this is bringing all sorts of wonderful things, or Western democracy is bringing sort of a basket of horrible things, but um, or then it is ignored. For your first question, of, I think that's interesting to think about the, the Gaokao as having a coercive mechanism, because you're right, this is a high stakes exam. The students have everything in their interest to try to get the highest score as possible because university education is still the access for social, the, the best access for social mobility in China. So the students that I've interviewed, um, they, they're very instrumental on the politics subject test. They recognize there is a standard answer, there is a model answer, and in fact, the examinations that I've collected, there's an answer key which provides model answers, and teachers teach to these model answers, and so they know that how to answer it correctly. They do it very instrumentally so they can access the highest points, and so what I think, it's, it's not actually socializing students in the, in the way that the regime, but I'm not sure it is, it is coercing them. Um, at least not directly, because they are, they're working the exam. They know the language, they know the rhetoric to use. And, and I should also add, the Chinese students that I've interviewed suggest that the politics subject test is actually one of the easiest on the exam, <laughs> because they have been socialized. They know the right standard answer, where the Chinese or the mathematics or whatever subject are, these These are the really, the, the, the subject test that they worry about. Thank you. Yes. Actually, it's okay. kind of a parallel question, so I wanted to, because I was thinking about Russia in this, and I was wondering, I know that you have your, the parameters of the field work, but just kind of observing what's happening and what, like, the political scientist colleagues would call authoritarian backlighting in Russia, I believe, that um, with this change in that, is Russia government using it more as coercive? I mean, I think of the case study of, like, this example of the father being arrested of the child who drew, uh, you know, right. anti-war thing in school, and I mean, I know it from Russians. Well, right, at cool least there, there's a lot more coercion. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, is there have, like you kind of ended at like one of the most exciting parts right, in the field work of thinking about you know, subvert, subvert, subverting democracy, but now is there a shift as we see this? Mm -hmm. No, I think that and I mean, how does it compare to China? Like, that, like, I mean, that might be a little too much, but I think um, so. I haven't collected any textbooks since the war ha has started. I'm not sure if there are any new ones available. I haven't, um, yes. but you this. Pardon? There's a new history textbook. There's a new history textbook. Okay. Yeah, so I, I do have the history textbooks, but so far I've only analyzed um, the social studies or civics textbooks. And But these same debates that I'm talking about are, have been taking place um, in the field of history as well. So I think what I observed is the last time I was in Russia was 20, 2019 and in classrooms, and I was there um, over some patriotic celebrations remembering World War II. And if there was a, a I would say a slight coercive dimension, it was felt by the teachers. 
that they had to introduce this patriotic programming. And a lot of it depended on the age or the generation of the teachers. So if they were brought up sort of more fully under the Soviet system, they were quite excited about the patriotic content. They saw this as being really formative in their own experience and trying to transmit it to what they thought of disillusioned youth. Um, the younger teachers felt a little bit more of a coercive dimension. Maybe they weren't socialized, they, but they saw these sort of extracurricular activities, which they were re required to do, sort of participate in this group called uh, Yun Armia, which is it's, it's, it's a youth group, kind of the equivalent of, of young pioneers. They do military training exercises, it's kind of like Boy Scouts. They shoot guns um, and do martial arts. So the teachers, the social studies teachers, were often tasked by their principals to lead these clubs, sort of extracurricular unpaid activities. Um, there was some resentment about that. They also had to create, um, they called them patriotic corners within their schools. Some schools had to create patriotic museums, which are really fascinating collection of materials from their community very militaristic, uh, but there was a strong pressure that they had to do this. So if I saw that coercive dimension, it, it might have been pressure on teachers to comply and integrate the patriotic pro programming, um, but also the recognition that despite the billions of rubles that have been infused into it, none of this is trickling down to the teachers themselves. In fact, every school I went to there, we haven't received any money. Tell us where this money is coming from. And I said, well, here's what the budget says. And um, but it's not really trickling down. I suspect since the war, um, the uh, uh, onslaught of the war, that there has been far more coercive dimensions. Uh, at least what I've been able to gather through social media and, and newspaper reports is schools and teachers are required to organize um, sort of patriotic assemblies um, and supporting, supporting the war efforts as well. And those who resist are certainly met with coercion. This is a long-winded answer no, no, to your question. but that was question. the second part was kind of like, is Russia borrowing to like the same? Like, I'm just wondering like how much, like you gave these uh, examples at the beginning and then you focused, narrowed in on Russia and China. And I'm wondering, is there like borrowing in these tactics? Or are they like different? I mean, like, does that make sense? Like, do they learn from each other? Do they apologize? Then the Russians that? would be learning from the Chinese. China or, or from these other countries? That My guess is that the Russians are learning from the Soviet past. And that this is a really long and rich history. In fact, that's what the teachers told me, that if we have the same resources, if young people had the same opportunities, these sort of intensive summer camps that were formative in our life, if they could experience that, the country would be on a very different trajectory. Um, but but I don't necessarily see the, the Russians looking to the Chinese experience, and certainly the, the Chinese aren't looking towards Russia. Or any other authoritarian no. It's more like In many ways, I think Russia and, and China are, I would say, you know, the, the leaders um, of political or patriotic education. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so one small question, a big question. So okay. I saw on um, the children's book that they had Anglisky president <laughs> instead of uh, Anglisky Karol or the king or something. Is that accidental or is that because they are nervous about talking about monarchy because of how it ended in Russia? Uh, or if you don't know, that's fine too. Um, and the second thing is I noticed that the Chinese narrative is way more buoyant and optimistic. Yes. And, um, you know, like high, high new sort of progressive modernity, whereas the Russians are way more sort of pessimistic. Um, is that is that because of, of China is still ruled by a nominally Marxist party, do you think? And whereas Russia has fallen, what do you think are deeper cultural things that work there that are hidden on the other surface. Great. Thank you for bo both of those questions. For the children's book, it says here's the 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 English uh English president and the German president. I don't know the right answer. My guess is that the author or the illustrator didn't actually know the, some of the distinctions or the nuances. They wouldn't call it the prime minister or they maybe wouldn't use the word king, that they just sort of, here's the US American president, here's the German president, um, and here's the English president. That would be my guess, that it would it was probably an honest mistake. As for the, the difference, the positivity or the negativity in the narratives, um, I'm, I'm glad that that came through because that is certainly something certainly that I have observed. Uh, the Chinese materials are far more optimistic. Um, in Chinese propaganda, they call this as what is it, positive energy posting. This is something that the propaganda agency is doing these positive energy posts, but it's, it is present and it, it's a much more optimistic view of how China is leading and moving the country forward. Now, if there is reflexivity of, of something that has gone wrong, it's always framed in such a way as, this happened, 
the party identified the problem and then corrected the problem, sort of came in and saved the day. And, and so it's still very positive message. There was a mistake. We, we recognize this mistake and now we're moving it forward. The post-Soviet context, and I think this is just the difference that we do have a break from the Soviet Union in, in Russia, that they are far more nuanced and complex in the ways that they talk about both the benefits of democracy and the negatives. This sort of I don't want to say indoctrination, but the positive energy posting is not necessarily resonating or a dominant narrative within within the Russian textbooks, the post-Soviet textbooks. But if you look at the Soviet textbooks, we do see a far more, I would say this is the kind of positive messaging that the party is leading, the party is delivering true democracy. And so I don't know if I can speak to, you know, Russian political culture as being more cynical or Chinese political culture as being more positive, but certainly you see this, these tendencies within, within the different um, textbooks. Thank you. Yes. Um, first, I just want to comment that it's really, uh, it was kind of hilarious to me to see just how much, especially the Chinese exams resembled, like the kind of stuff I was taught in my um, American religious education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and uh, the second thing is that um, uh, so there's this um, inherent contradiction within the Russian uh, narrative of like, so the, the problem is that the people, they're too submissive. So just stay submissive a little bit longer and we'll fix it. <laughs> How does that like? <laughs> no, it, it is. Um... You're, you've absolutely sort of, sort of, you know, hit the nail on it. This is striking that it's in the same textbook and often in the same chapter. That you know, democracy is great, the transition is terrible. It's the problem of the Russian people, but they should be submissive because maybe we need a strong centralized. It is not a, a very intuitive or linear, linear narrative, and it, it's frustrating. And the students recognize this as well. Uh, probably the teachers, as they're trying to teach this material, are thinking, okay, now we're going to talk about democracy is wonderful, and then also what democracy looks like in our in our own context, and the importance of not being politically active or, or politically engaged. I mean, this is Russian people, Russian young people, Chinese young people are very, very clued in into these sort of these mixed messages, um, and they can identify them. Yes. Uh, I, I'm very interested in your research because I personally took Gaokao uh, and took the politics exam and it really matches with my experiences. And my question would be, I'm very interested in like the uh, discourses that they share among like China and the Russia mm -hmm. education systems. And for example, um, people are not suitable for democracy. It is also a very common and popular narrative in China. And it is even before like the PRC exists, maybe in the early 20th century. So I'm wondering like how those uh, narratives, discourses, they maybe uh, diffuse among regions and changes uh, along the time. Okay, great. Thank you for your question. And, and um, it's funny when I've presented this talk mostly to a, a Chinese audience, uh, many people share um, the same comment that you did that, oh, I took the Gaokao. <laughs> and usually there's a, a couple people with a like, sort of PTSD from the Gaokao. It's a really high stakes exam, like looking at these questions brought back all of these horrible memories. <laughs> so I hope that wasn't, um, wasn't the case. As we think, um, in terms of if, if your question, sorry, I just lost the, what was the last point of your... Uh, so I'm kind of interested in the genealogy. Of oh, the genealogy the across. This. So I've just started um, another project. So what I've collected so far are essentially national exam number one. But if you know anything about the Gaokao system in China, beginning in 2000, there's a kind of a proliferation of different exams, depending on the region that you live. So Beijing and Shanghai, Guangdong have always had their own exams. But there's national exam one, national exam two, three, new curriculum. And this has to do with changes in, in the textbooks. Different regions are studying different textbooks. Now there's pressure to sort of centralize it. So at one point, I think in 2012, there were 14 or 15 different exams being offered compared to the 1980s when there were one or two. And so we see this sort of proliferation. So I'm in the process now, I've collected all of these different exams because I'm interested precisely in the part of your question about regional variation. Do we see differences in the politics content in different parts of China, in maybe a region which has a larger minority population um, as opposed to Beijing, 
Um, and so thinking about regional, I don't have the answer, unfortunately, to, I'm just, you'll have to sort of stay tuned to be continued, but I'm definitely interested in those questions. Um, and the interviews that I've done with the examination writers and the folks that grade these exams, one of the interesting things that I learned across the different variations is the politics subject test is the only test that has to get central approval. So there's a long process of how you write these exams. Um, examination, the people who write the questions are university professors, high school teachers. They get sequestered essentially for a couple of weeks, sometimes up to a month. Their cell phones are taken away. All of their communication um, is, is monitored because it's such a high stakes exam. And their examination questions go through processes of review. So if we are an exam committee, we're writing our questions. We have no idea if our examination questions are gonna make it to this exam. It's, it's a state secret, it's guarded. Um, but one of the examiners explained to me the politics test has to be, once they have their final version for each of the region, get sent up to the Ministry of Education to make sure that it is, I'm guessing, on the right message. And so there is some central government oversight. And my observations thus far is that we see some of the exact same questions appearing on all of the exams that I've looked at, um, but there's also ver uh, differences. And so I'm in the process of helping understand if it, what regional variation looks like. You know, is Beijing more about central government and the party, where Shanghai is about economics? Thinking about are these variations? Yes. So I'm also very interested in the. Uh, background story how the so called professor they make this exam. Mm -hmm. So, to what degree the agency they have during the process? Because a recent chance I observed in Gaokao is that they are a little bit politicalized. So, in the answer key, there are two questions one is highly ideological, like the CP is great and what they do is um, the superiority of CP. And the second is more economic. So the answer key would say, answer the first answer is not correct, but it's not the most appropriate answer for the questions. So it seems that the professional elite or cultural elites did have some of agency in deciding the exam questions. I think you're right. And the 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 question writers or examination writers that I have interviewed, they exp uh, first of all, it's an honor to be selected for this. So a principal would be really excited if members of her faculty were uh, were offered this position. I think it's a pretty heavy lift for some of the the individuals themselves. You're sequestered for a week. I mean, one one um, report talks about it. You get locked in your rooms at night. There are guard dogs going up and down the hallways. All paper is burned at the end of the day because they don't want to have any cheating on this really high stakes exam. Um, but I think each of the groups probably do have some agency. I didn't ask specifically about it. Um, in the project that I'm, I'm working on. Let's see if I can show show you if I go forward. Um, sorry, sorry. Okay. So I'm classifying the types of questions. And so this comes out of, these are the main categories in Chinese political education courses, um, except for, for patriotism, I would say that's in, inherent in there. So questions about ideology, philosophy, uh, institutions would be the party, economics. And part of what I'm doing is, is precisely that, is trying to figure out what is the recipe of, you know, do you need 20% economics? What percentage of ideology? How much current events needs to go in in the exam? And so this is some early coding of it from 1980 to I think 2000. So what you can see in the 80s until about 1986, most of the questions are really ideological in orientation. But you know, after June 4th and moving into the 1990s, we see a convergence of three themes, and this is true today. So philosophy or ideology, uh, questions on economics play a, a sizable role and institutions, sort of the role of the party, party governance, what the party is delivering. And so we move away from complete ideology to sort of a, of a mishmash to these kind of three core cohesive themes. Um, and the language of the exams have become, how would I say, say less ideological over time, uh, particularly the economics questions. If you look at the econ questions in the 70s or the 80s, it's about socialist, you know, socialist versus capitalism. Now it's about fixed and floating exchange rates, the role of central banks. I've taken some of the economics questions and showed them to economists um, who are just in the office above me. And they said, you know, I would probably 
ask these questions in a macro or micro. So the sort of ideology is, is less present in every single question, where in the 1980s, um, and or particularly in the Maoist era, you see this kind of ideology steeped into to, to politics. But this is also the case if you looked at the other subject tests, um, on the Galkal questions in the 1950 and the mathematics questions, these are not neutral mathematics questions, but there's politics in it. So for an example, one of the questions talks about uh, a Japanese plane flying over uh, the Northeast of China and dropping bombs on villages. And this, it's this kind of a story problem. The students need to calculate the casualties over the, the week. So, I mean, it's a math question, but there's a strong political message here. And this is kind of a, you know, a, an extreme example, but the politics is steeped into all of the other um, subject tests. I haven't looked, you know, in the most recent exams, but my guess would be there's very little politics probably in the math now. It's just really difficult math. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm curious that you have mentioned you have interviewed the students. Yes. Um, and, uh, is, can you see any impact on the political education? Because you you know you mentioned that some say this is a tool for them to go through the learn, but the most of them are have the critical thinking or just believe the the things that you learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for China. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so, you know, and it, it speaks to this larger issue, does this really work? We know that these regimes like Russia and China are investing heavily in political education. Are they sort of getting their bang for the buck? They think they are. I mean, they continue to invest, um, you know, millions of dollars into it. Um, after June 4th or Tiananmen Square, one of the first public speeches of, of Deng Xiaoping, he, he comes out and says, the problem with young people these days is they didn't have enough political education. We didn't teach them about what life was like in the hard, you know, the hard days. Uh, if we look at, Hong Kong as well. Uh, political, it's called national security education is being introduced into Hong Kong schools from universities down, down to kindergarten. And it looks in many ways, the content is similar to political education in China. So the point is that the regimes think it is working. I am more skeptical that it is really working. My interviews with the students um, in both cases, particularly in China, they see it as really kind of instrumental. They know the standard answer. They know they have to answer it in a certain way. Um, one, one story I'll just share with you as a student was describing um, his high school, his university experience where every Wednesday he had to take a required politics class. Everybody in his major had to take it. So it was a big lecture hall. The teacher wasn't very dynamic. And so the students came together and they each week, two students were selected, secretly selected among them. One would be the note taker and the other one would be the questioner. <laughs> and the rest of the students, you had to show up because they take attendance and you have to be there sort of butt in chair to get you know credit so you can pass the class so you can get your degree. And so this, they sort of solve this collective action problem. One is diligently taking notes, which he can share or she can share with her colleagues. And the other one is occasionally asking a question at the professor. So the professor probably recognizes this. You would know that if just one person is, they think it is an engaged class. And so this was the strategy. And, you know, another student said, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we did that too. This was study hall or sleeping periods. And so is it really doing what the regime hopes it's doing? Um, it's not, I don't believe it is indoctrinating, at least what the students uh, shared with me. What I have seen and what, where I think in both Russia and China is, is that it might be building sort of patriotism, sort of love of country, general love of country, love of China, love of Russia, but not necessarily love of Putin or love of the Communist Party as well. This sort of broad associational support as well. Um, because it does talk about, the, the Chinese exam and the Russian materials talk about wonderful accomplishments, whether it's you know uh, satellites or gene splicing or technology or high-speed rail. These are really impressive developmental accomplishments. And it's not a lie. And so it's, it's something that, that Chinese young people should be proud of. Thank you for your question. Let's, yes, you haven't had a chance to answer. Yeah, um, thank you. It's a really engaging um, presentation. I have a question about aesthetics. Okay. Um, because the, the, the Putin um, children's book that you started with was very remarkable um, in a literal <laughs> sense, I guess. Um, and the, the format of it was the book uh, print, which has a long centuries yes. long history um, in, in, um, uh, in Russia. And 
So in, in my reading, I, I feel like that format was very intentionally chosen, possibly to connect Putin to this tradition or possibly even this national myth um, of you know, Russian orthodoxy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so while it might not be the research focus of your book, I'm just wondering if you've anecdotally experienced um, you know, political education materials like this that have a more visual um, a visual. Um, and, uh, and how the, and I guess specifically, um, sort of similarly ideologized images in China, in, mm -hmm. in the Chinese context, and just generally how the aesthetics might affect the mm -hmm. investigation. That's a, a, a great question. So I'm not an expert on aesthetics, but I'm glad that you recognized that there is some continuity with the, the Putin's book. Um, I mean, the, the way that the characters are written, the style, the colors, um, it is, you look at it and immediately you would recognize sort of some continuity with Russia. And I, I would agree that it's very intentional, trying to show this, this cultural continuity. Um, the textbooks themselves, there was a debate in the 1990s, beginning into 2000, about, uh, about the political education textbooks or social studies textbooks, that they were going too Western. Um, and so there was criticism. They had pictures sort of which looked very much like sort of standard photo stock you might find of like boys and girls sitting down at a table and doing some, playing some kind of game. And there was criticism among some some Russian circles that these were not Russian looking. The pictures were too Americanized. They were too Westernized. <laughs> They just it really just looked like cardstock. I mean, they were just trying to save money, I think, the publishers. And then there was a pushback of trying to have more, which would be, quote unquote, authentically Russian pictures. So I guess little girls with the buntiki, the little, um, what would you call them, bows? Yeah, the little bright bows and something that looks, I would say, much more nostalgic um, that follows after that. But the, the interesting thing is that the textbooks are not, even though the, the Ministry of Education can give its stamp of approval, it's an open market. And so there's a variety of, uh, of textbooks out there for, for aesthetics. The only other thing I would say about the, the Chinese context is when we think about the sort of images and the use of aesthetics, the, the, the Chinese communists um, and just the, the Soviets uh, as well, they have this sort of long tradition of using, I guess I would call it as like magazines or little, little miniature comic books, very small. So even if you were not literate, you could flip through the images and it would tell you a, a, a really important narrative about, you know, fighting the imperialists or fighting the Guomindang. Um, and so the aesthetics are, are very much linked to sort of Chinese brush painting or, or woodblock images. And so showing this, this kind of continuity, but using images in a way to convey political messages, especially political education, when the majority of your population might not be that literate. And again, the Soviets did the same thing. Some of the textbooks that I, I have just looked at anecdotally, it's not a textbook, it's a children's book um, from 1926. It's called A Story of Lenin which is basically teaching the history of the revolution and has these beautiful like images all about teaching about Lenin um, and teaching young people to read through the history of the revolution and what, what the revolution de delivered. Yes. So um, you gave examples from the textbooks and featured many of civics courses. And I'm wondering, um, this may or may not be in the scope of what you've been studying, but I'm wondering, um, what is the situation with humanities? more broadly and particularly like literature uh, courses in middle school and high school and in terms of both what is on their reading lists and also yeah. what it is they are supposed to be talking about what they're discussing this various well, works. thank you. That is a terrific question. One of the interesting things about the teacher's manuals that I've collected is that they include different subsections for different courses. And so a professor of literature or music can look at it and find out what patriotic hymns, is that the right word, pa patriotic songs that it can use in the, in the classroom. And so these are really detailed helpful documents about how to integrate patriotic content, which is expected and encouraged in the classroom. And so I think we see this sort of push towards patriotism in all subjects. Um, I know I, I have collected, but I, I, some of the reading lists that are sort of recommended reading lists for a literature class at, at different levels, to, just to see what material is being encouraged. Um, and which Soviet ones are, are, are sort of making a reappearance or, or returning as well. But I haven't looked very systematically. But the, the teacher's handbooks provide a wonderful guideline for the reluctant teacher who says, okay, I teach music. 
let's figure out how we have to fo you know, follow this mandate of integrating patriotic programming. Here's some games, here's some puzzles, and here's you know, a skit or play that we can integrate in the class. <laughs> yeah, um, and we've talked about this um, previously, briefly before, but I was just wondering how is paramilitary training integrated into this whole educational scheme? I know each has a common shared experience that you go through at all levels of education, there's like different paramilitary training. I don't know what's changing like in Russia and how do you see yeah. it in the general lens of like education? Thank you. Um, I can speak more to the Re Russia case because this was something I was quite interested in. And so in Russia, there's different classes where civics edu or political education would appear. It could be social studies, it could be history. Um, but there's also a military, in, in some schools, it's called a military patriotic education course. There's also a course called OBG, which is kind of, I can translate, it's like a security civil course, defense. civil defense course. The textbooks for this they are fascinating. They are just like the Soviet Union. Uh, you learn how to, you know, put on a gas mask, take apart a Kalashnikov, how to throw a grenade. And by the way, it's like they describe it as doing a cartwheel, <laughs> which okay, I was like, that's helpful news, I guess. Uh, helpful information. But you throw the grenades as you throw, throw the cartwheel. Um, and when I was in Russian schools, I observed some of these these classrooms, and mostly they are selected in. Uh, it's mostly men or boys that go into these classes, and the girls might be in. Um, like house, what would we call it? Home and economics, right? And so these the pretty gender dynamic, but not often the case. And the after school activities, this this group called Youth Army, uh, um, Youth Army or Young Army, is largely young young boys. These are after school extracurricular activities where they do a lot of um, martial arts training. Surprisingly, the role of the Orthodox Church, maybe not surprisingly, is there as well as, as often playing a, like a troop leader as, as, as the Orthodox priest, as well as um, a former military member of fathers usually leads the group. And they do weekend camping trips, shooting guns, um, trying to in many ways recreate the experience of young pioneers, but it is a, at this much smaller, smaller level. Um, and so it is present within the, the post-Soviet context, but not to the same extent that it was in, in the Soviet. What I can say also from the textbooks is comparing the post-Soviet context, the Soviet textbooks, the Soviet textbooks, they have this militaristic element, but it's far more optimistic. The post-Soviet textbooks, the way they talk about sort of the intensity of needing to defend the motherland, serving the fatherland, doing your duty, it is at a, a higher level, it seems far more intense. So a stronger emphasis on this duty to defend and serve, to do your obligatory military service is really reinforced again and again. And this message is also in the Soviet textbooks, but it is there are far other topics, you know, far many other topics going on. So it, in, in some ways, the post-Soviet is a bit more militaristic. Thank you. I think we have time for one, one last question. question. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm a newly retired public high school teacher. Okay. And what I'm wondering is, I forget how many years ago it was, but our Michigan State Legislature pushed for the Pledge of Allegiance to be required to be set in classrooms again, which was not the case when I mm -hmm. first started. And I'm wondering in China or Russia, um, if, besides the national anthem, is there anything similar to the American Pledge of Allegiance that students are required to say as part of their day. As part of their day. So often, um, one of the apartments I lived in in China, I was so lucky to live next to an elementary school. <laughs> and early in the morning, you know, the parents would be dropping off their, their child and they have the flag raising ceremony. And so I, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, and the entire school sort of, it was so cute. They would all line up in, in order and they'd have their little red, um, and then certain students would be designated to, um, to raise the flag, and they did it. They were they took it so seriously, throwing their hands up. And so this kind of ritual, it was a big honor to be selected. Um, and so this kind of commute, and then they would do their morning calisthenics all together, and often there would be patriotic music along. And so there are these, I think, rituals being in some ways built into the educational system, and that was bringing the entire school together. And of course, the teachers were on the sidelines as well. So maybe a bit more extensive than just the Pledge of Allegiance in the classroom. Well, thank you all. I know we're out of time, but I really appreciate your questions. They're wonderful. Thank you.